So today we're going to be learning about HTTP and AJAX. We'll get to what that is later. But HTTP is the, the protocol for the web. This is how uh, clients and servers on the internet, how different computers can communicate with each other over the internet. Um, and so, uh, you know, generally speaking, there are strict rules about how applications communicate with each other over the internet. You know, like I just said these are it's called a protocol. These rules of how we communication of how we communicate, but things get complicated because the web is not actually defined by a single protocol, but by a stack of protocols. So the first of these protocols that you should be aware of, and I'm not gonna go in depth at all, this is something you could spend a semester on or longer. Um, I just want you to be familiar with some of these terms kind of vaguely. First protocol that you should be aware of, you've probably heard of this before, is the internet protocol. Or IP. So, IP, the internet protocol, is concerned with where a server is located on the internet. And this location is described with an address called an IP address. kind of similar to a physical address because it tells you um, actually where in the world the server is located. So like based on an IP address, you can infer a zip code of where a request is coming from. Uh, so currently the web uses the fourth version of the internet protocol. There are efforts currently um, to move to the sixth version. So I think that within my career, this is a major change that I'm going to see at some point, uh, maybe not within this decade, but I do think that within my career, we're going to transition away from IPv4 and IPv6 will become dominant. Um, so an IPv4 address, kind of what that looks like, it's uh, four numbers separated by periods. So if you've never seen an IP address before, uh, you know, that is an example. It's four numbers separated by periods, each of them between zero and 255. So like I was saying before, this describes where on the internet a given server is located. And normally when you visit a website, you're not typing in an IP address, you type in a domain name. But behind the scenes, your browser has to convert that domain name into an IP address so it knows where to send the request. So this conversion from a domain name to an IP address, this is done uh, using a network of servers called the domain name system. Or DNS. Uh, we're going to cover that later on in this course, so don't worry about that too much for now. But so long story short, this is the internet protocol lets us know where things are on the internet. So beyond where things are, we need TCP, which is the transmission control 
protocol. TCP is not concerned with where things are on the internet, but once we know where something is, TCP is concerned with how it gets there. So more specifically, um, TCP provides ordered, error checked delivery of a stream of bytes between applications running on hosts, applications running on hosts that communicate via an IP. So uh, because of this special protocol, this guarantees that uh, data that we send over the network is going to be more reliable, essentially. Um, there are just a lot of ways for a request on the internet to fail. Sometimes it's because of physical problems with the wires or you know, temporary issues with your internet service provider that maybe get resolved in a minute or whatever or in a second later. It's very, you know, the global internet infrastructure is complex. It can be kind of hard to know why something messes up sometimes, but at least built into the protocol, we have this error checking. So that if you're sending a request and the recipient didn't actually get the thing that you tried to send because there's an error over the wire, there is some mechanism built into this protocol that will automatically uh, resend the request and get confirmations that you're actually talking to who you think you're talking to. Now, this also means that a TCP request is going to be a little bit slower because every TCP connection actually requires multiple requests to initiate. This is known as a three way handshake, just as like the client and the server kind of going back and forth, making sure that they're talking to who they think they're talking to instead of just blindly sending data over the internet. So these two protocols go hand in hand, hand in glove. Um, so frequently, they're often talked about together. Sometimes people just use this one term, TCP IP, to refer to both of these protocols together. And then uh, lastly, the subject of today's lecture is the HTTP protocol, the hypertext transfer protocol. So if we think of the web as a stack of protocols, this is on top of TCP, which is on top of IP. So TCP is concerned with how your data gets transmitted, but doesn't care at all what your data is. HTTP is concerned um, with what your data is and how it's formatted. So uh, to learn a little bit more about HTTP, I've got some slides for y'all. So everybody loves slideshows. It looks like you're restricting access to those slides in the notes. Uh, are you not able to click through that? No, when I clicked on it, it said you, I needed to request access. Hmm. I might have to change some settings on that because there aren't any secrets there. Y'all should be able to access it. So yeah, like I was saying, um, HTTP is the hypertext transfer protocol, originally described in 1991 for the purpose of just transmitting hypertext, which like we said before, is basically just a document with links to other documents. So um, the web has really grown a lot past the original intentions of HTTP. Um, so yeah, the modern equivalent of hypertext would be HTML. It's a specific hypertext language. 
And like I was saying, it's really uh, grown a lot beyond its original intentions. So now we're building um, complete applications, not just documents uh, that are served over HTTP, including you know not just the structure in the HTML, but styling and logic, CSS and JavaScript, and you know APIs that pull in other data sources from different websites. So probably the first thing you need to know about HTTP practically as a developer is kind of the rhythm of this conversation. In any HTTP conversation, there are two, two parties. There's the client, which is the one sending the request. That's typically, you know, like a laptop or desktop computer or mobile phone or whatever. And then you've got the server, which is another computer connected to the internet, which is just passively sitting around waiting, listening for clients to send a request. And then when it gets a request, processes it and sends a response. Um, but very much, it's just another computer somewhere else on the internet. Uh, you can see from this picture that these computers don't have mice and keyboards or monitors because there's no one actually sitting at them, using them interactively, but they are very much just regular Linux computers, kind of like the ones that we might develop on. So this is, this is a very rigid uh, rhythm. The client sends one request, the server sends one response, and then that's the end of the HTTP conversation. Uh, HTTP does not have any way for the server to proactively send data to a client. They can only send responses in response to requests. Evan? Yeah, was this where you were saying where um, information transferred over the internet can only be um, sent by strings? So this is what you were talking about between servers and us, um, the information back and forth is like all strings? Yeah. So uh, in this example here, you can see an actual HTTP response or an HTTP request on the left and HTTP response on the right. So this is like actually how data is transmitted between the client and server and it's all strings. Um, you know, it might look like there's a number in here, but it's transmitted as a string data type. So if you wanted to do math on this, you're going to have to convert it and parse it yourself. Um, but I want to I want to talk about the specific parts of this HTTP request because this isn't like completely unintelligible. These are intended to be read by humans. So if you understand what is actually in an HTTP request, what's transmitted, I think it helps your understanding as a developer. So at the top, you've got the main request line. This first line is going to show you the most important information about the request. So the first bit is the request type. There are a few different types of requests that are kind of intended to mean different things. This is showing a GET request, the most common type of HTTP request which is generally used for requesting data from a website. And then afterwards is the uh, URI, they call it. It's not a full URL. It doesn't actually tell us you know, where on the internet this website is because remember the HTTP protocol isn't concerned with where the server is. It's just what data we're sending. So, this is like a reference to inside of the web application. Given that we already know like the full URL, you know, www.mysite.com, this is a path inside of that website, mysite.com slash bio.html, for example. Um, and then lastly is what version of HTTP are we using? Just making sure that the client and the server are both using the same version of HTTP so that they're speaking the same language. Nowadays, every server you're going to find is using version 1.1 of HTTP. So then after the main request line, you have headers, which is just kind of additional metadata about the request. So here you have a host, which is saying like, what is the domain name of the website that you're trying to contact? So in this case, it's example.com. That might seem a little bit redundant. Um, because I just said before that the IP protocol is concerned with where the server is. 
But the thing is that it's actually possible to have multiple different websites live on the same server with the same IP address. So sometimes you need this host in order to disambiguate which web application you're actually requesting. Um, and then lastly, there's a user agent here, just as an example header. A request might have like dozens of headers on it. Here we're just showing two. Uh, and the user agent identifies who is sending the request. Uh, in this case, it says Google Chrome. But commonly, the user agent is not very useful. Um, there are kind of historical reasons for that. There were times when, like, there were certain features that, for example, only worked in Internet Explorer. And so some web developers would, like, check, are you using Internet Explorer? If so, use this feature, else don't. And then other browsers started adding those features as well, but they still didn't get used in websites because the website was explicitly checking, are you Internet Explorer? So what kind of happened over time is that every browser just lies and says that it is every other browser, which is kind of hilarious, but not super useful if you're just reading it. So I'm just gonna show you that real quick. Um, let me see, network. Um, actually, I'm gonna do it in this other tab here. Yeah. All right, so here is the request that I sent to github.com. I don't actually put this on the bottom. Um, okay, so here's my user agent. So just to be clear, I'm using Chrome on Mac OS, but my user agent starts with Mozilla um, then it says Apple WebKit, which refers to Safari. And then lastly, it says Chrome and then also says Safari. So my browser is trying to identify is basically every browser simultaneously, just because it doesn't want to get left out of any features that are checking for specific browsers. Um, so this is a very common user agent string. And there are some ways to actually infer what browser it came from by reading it but it's not easy to tell with your eyes. I'm sorry, I think I missed it. Where was it that it was faking? Can you go back and show me that? Um, so here I'm in the network tab, just checking out the requests that my browser has sent. The oh. top one is the main request for this page. Uh -huh. And then I scroll down in the headers section to the request headers. So, because there's headers on both the request and the response. And then the very last header, or yeah, very last header here is the user agent, where my browser is masquerading as every browser simultaneously. The upgrade insecure requests? Or can you not see the line below upgrade insecure requests? I can't. Can you guys? Oh. Hang on a second. Yes, I can see it. Can. The user agent line. Why can't I see it? I can't see it either. How about now? That was weird. Yeah, I can see it now. I guess just the bottom like five pixels of my screen are cut off. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. Right, so like I was saying, I've got the request line the method, URI, protocol version. Um, a few different types of requests. I wanna say there's maybe like a dozen, a couple dozen different types of requests. Um, but like 99% of the requests you're ever going to send are gonna be one of these four. Um, there's a fifth one that maybe you'll use sometimes, but like 99% of the requests you'll ever send, one of these four, but even more specifically, like most of them are gonna be get or post and probably mostly get. So some of these are much more popular than others, but 
Uh, moreover, they don't actually do different things. So this is something that I think a lot of people get kind of confused about with these HTTP verbs. They don't actually do different things. They just mean different things. So like a post request is commonly understood as being used for sending data to create a resource. Put requests are commonly understood to be uh, sending data to update a resource, but these don't actually force the server to do anything. The server has to read the request and see, oh, it's a post. They probably are trying to create data here and then do what is being asked of them. There isn't really any mechanical difference um, between these different request types beyond how the server is coded to interpret them. Um, with one kind of minor exception, um, for post put and sometimes delete requests, you can add a body to the request, which is just extra data that's included. So, you know, we showed you the main request line and then headers. For a get request, that's the only type of data you can include. Um, for these other types of requests, then you can also include a body. So to use kind of a postal metaphor for this, I think of post put and delete requests as like sending an envelope, but they're different colored envelopes so that the server can you know, have some kind of sorting system so it treats them differently. But a get request is like sending a postcard. Very similar, it still you know, goes through the mail the same way, but it doesn't have an inside. It doesn't have any private contents to it. Everything about the get request is publicly available written on the outside of it. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of highlighting things that I talked about before. Yeah, so here we're seeing an example of a post request. It's just, you know, a different request type, post instead of get, headers can be similar. But also, optionally, you can have a body. So the body can have any kind of text in it, but commonly, um, the body is going to have JSON text. So that's you know basically just a JavaScript object formatted as text. Here, though, we're seeing a different data format. This is called a URL formatted text. So in this format, it's just, it's still key value pairs, but the, the format, the syntax is key equals value, and then an ampersand to separate other key value pairs. So the query is new Jordan and the color is red. Now, if you want to uh, send a get request, that has additional data in it. You know, you can't have a body with a get request. I told you those are only for uh, post, put, and delete other request types. So for a get request, you can actually put extra data in the URL itself. So maybe some of us have seen a URL that has a question mark in it. So the question mark indicates a query string. Everything after the question mark is not actually part of the URL itself but it's just additional data that you want to send to the server. So in this case, the actual URL that we're trying to request is search slash search. But then there's additional data that we want to send to the server about you know, what we're searching for. So the query is Air Jordans and then color is red. So then in the server, when you're processing this, you're going to process this request in the same function that processes all of the search requests, because you would have one function for this um, URL on your server. But then you would get access to this information as variables, the query and the color. So like I was saying, there are request headers on every request. The host header, I believe, is the only required header. So I think that this is always sent on every request. Um, 
Other common headers are language settings, uh, user agent, and then uh, response formats that you can accept. So, you know, just letting the server know that you're a web browser, you're prepared to parse HTML. So the server will send you HTML in response to your request. So there are also HTTP responses that we get back from the server. These have their own format to them. They're pretty similar to the requests. They have the main response line saying again, the version that was used. And then there's a status code. This is a three digit number that gives a very brief description of what happened. You know, was it successful? Did it fail? Why did it fail? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then afterwards is just kind of an English description of the status code. So 200 is the most generic success. It just means like, yeah, we did what you asked for. Congratulations. Without anything more specific. So the only, the you know most concise way that you could summarize that is just okay. Um, there are headers in the response. So this tells the client how big the response was. So it knows, you know, what actually is the response, like where it starts and ends and where something else begins. Um, you know, like imagine the data coming in is just like a pack of zebras and it's kind of hard to know where one starts and one ends unless someone tells you like the request is from this bit to that bit. So content length is important. Uh, date is nice to know when it was actually received. Content type, because browsers can parse different kinds of content and they might parse uh, present it in different ways. Like HTML, we're gonna parse that and show a document. But if it's like JSON text, uh, the browser might display that differently. And then optionally, you can include a body. Um, I say it's optional, but it's very common for the response to have a body. Generally, the reason why we send an HTTP request is because we wanted to get a body in the response, such as an HTML document or a CSS file. So very common that the HTTP response has a body. And yeah, this is just kind of underlining what I was saying before. So there's a bunch of status codes. These are some very common ones. Um, 200 being okay, just generic status, generic success. Anything in the 300 range between 300 and 399 is a, a redirection. So 302 is, I believe, a temporary redirect. 400 is bad request. There's people kind of disagree about what exactly counts as a bad request. In my opinion, it means that you sent something that is not HTML, or I'm sorry, you sent something that is not HTTP. And so the server can't even try to understand it. It's not like, you asked it to do something that is incompatible with the internal business logic. Like you asked it to do something and the server is like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Uh, 400 means like, this is not HTTP. I have no idea what you're asking me to do. Completely unintelligible. Um, but I've seen people use this status to mean slightly different things. Um, 401 is unauthorized, means you need to be logged in to do something that you are not logged in for. Uh, 404, this is a pretty common one. I think all of us have seen this before. If you try to request something that doesn't exist on the server, the server is gonna say like, yeah, I know what you're asking for and we don't have any of those here. So it's gonna say 404 not found. Uh, basically anytime you type in a URL that doesn't exist on that server, you're gonna get a 404 error. And then another common one that you've probably seen is 500 internal server error. So that's just a generic um, server failure. There's a bunch of like 500 level errors between 500 and 599. That means something messed up on the server. But generally speaking, um, you know, if the server crashes, you weren't expecting it to. And so like 
you're probably not going to be prepared for different kinds of server errors. Because if you were prepared for those server errors, they wouldn't have happened. You would have prepared for them and prevented them. And you wouldn't need to send an error message at all. So 500 is definitely the most common uh, server error message because your server is going to send that for unexpected, unhandled server errors. Um, let's take a look real quick. I really love this Wikipedia article about status codes. It's just got a list of them and it's pretty nicely laid out. So the temple, the table of contents should kind of explain pretty clearly the different types of status codes. So 100 to 199 is just informational. It's not that it was successful or failed. 200 to 299 is success. 300 is redirections. 400 is client errors. So the person sending the request did something wrong. And then 500 is server errors. The server did something wrong. Um, so these 100 responses, I honestly don't see these very often at all. I'm not really sure what they're for. Um, 200 responses, you see these very commonly. By far the most common is 200, but sometimes these other ones are used. So if you're sending data to a server to ask them to create something, like maybe if you're logging in or um, registering for a website or posting a blog post, you might get a 201 response instead. Um, sometimes you see no content. If you ask a server to do something and it does it successfully, but it doesn't need to give you any response, like you're not asking it for data, you're asking it to do something, the server does it successfully. It might give you a 204 response to be like, we did everything you asked for and you didn't ask for any content. Uh, so 300 is for redirection. There's a couple of different kinds. Uh, 301 is moved permanently. So like if you have a website with a really great or a really popular domain name that you know everybody knows about, but you need to change your business's name. So you change the domain name. Well, it kind of sucks because so many people have bookmarked your old site. So you can do a 301 uh, response for the old site and redirect them to the new site so that people know that, you know, that old URL, even though it still takes you to the right place, it's the old URL and that they should update their bookmarks. Um, 302 is the opposite of that. It's moved temporarily. So it's a temporary redirect, but, you know, people, clients shouldn't be like saving that information about where the new server is because it's not going to stay there for long. Um, oh, so not modified. This is an important one. You're going to probably see this a lot um, when you're developing. So uh, generally, you know, when you send a request to a website for like an HTML page, it's going to give you that HTML page. And that HTML page is going to have links to CSS files and script tags. And then your browser is going to send requests for those as well. However, if you, are if you are visiting a website for the second time, it's likely that you already have those scripts, those CSS files, everything that the server is going to send you, you've already got it. So um, your browser has a cache built in where it can save files that it has used recently. And it's capable of telling the server like, hey, I've already got you know, this and this file as of this date. Like, is that out of date? Do I need to get a new version? And so the server might say like, okay, if you, if you got a copy of our CSS file from last week, like that's still the latest version. We have not modified it since then. So just use the version you've got instead of downloading a new one. So that saves you from sending extra data unnecessarily over the internet. So you'll uh, see a lot of 304 responses if you revisit a site that you've been to in the past. So actually, let's see if we can see that here. 
So your page will still load like normal, but you would have to go into the dev tools to say, hey, this is a previous copy I already had. That happens automatically. You don't have to open the dev tools. Well, I mean, but like when I open a web page, it's not flashing across the screen 304, right? So like to actually know the response that I'm getting, I'd have to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you want to know the status code, you'd have to look it up in here. The only reason why your browser would put the status code on the screen is if it's a 404 or 500 error and you're seeing that from um, the website itself. So, let's see, okay, so I have to uncheck disable cache because I'm trying to show you the caching behavior now. Okay, so now you can see this style sheet. I guess I had this already. It's, that's a 304. Um, actually, kind of surprised there aren't more 304 responses. The main document got me a 304 response. So this Wikipedia article has not changed since the last time I viewed it. Hmm. Now, kind of expected more 304 responses, but we saw a few in there. Anyway, I'm going to turn the cat or turn disable cache back on before I forget about this and then end up banging my head against the wall, debugging some CSS. So that was 300. Oh. I guess I don't know the difference between moved permanently and permanent redirect. They sound pretty similar to me. Um, so 400, these are the client errors, bad request, unauthorized are things you're gonna see commonly. Uh, forbidden is similar to 401. This means that you are logged in, but your user doesn't have permission to do the things that you're trying to do. So 401 is we don't know who you are, so we can't let you do anything. Um, 403 is we know who you are and you're not allowed to do the thing you're trying to do. Um, 404 is not found, you've seen that. 405 method not allowed is, you know, you tried to send a post request, but this URL only accepts get requests. 409 is just, the request took too long, the server wasn't able to respond to you. So you might see this occasionally. Uh, conflict is just kind of a generic, like internal business logic, like doesn't make sense. Um, like you tried to set your bank account to a negative number, I guess. Like I understand what you're asking me to do and that just doesn't make any sense. Um, a lot of these kind of do what they sound like. Uh, this is maybe my favorite status code, 418 on a teapot. Um, technologists are always silly people, often, and people try to slip April Fool's jokes into like actual real standards documents. And so somebody actually put a status code in the HTTP protocol for in case you try to send a request to an HTTP connected a teapot and you ask it to brew coffee, that's an error because a coffee pot cannot brew tea. And so that coffee pot should respond to you that I'm a teapot, you know, as an explanation for why it cannot brew coffee for you. Uh, as you're using APIs, you might see this, too many requests means you didn't do any specific thing that's invalid or illegal. You just did it too fast, too many times. Um, so again, 500 is definitely the most common 500 error. It means your server failed and we're not really sure why. We were just barely able to send a response that something messed up. Uh, bad gateway is also something that we might see much later in the course as we're deploying our applications online. This actually means that like something in our deployment is probably messed up, something before our Django server failed. Um, yeah, and those are probably the only ones that you're going to be using. Uh, I think this is kind of funny. 
Previously, instead of 429 for you sent too many requests, Twitter used to use 420 enhance your calm as John Spartan. APS status code. Pardon? John Spartan. Enhance your calm, John Spartan from Demolition Man. Yeah, it says it right there. Okay. I'm not losing my mind. I'll shut up. Sorry. Oh. Oh, the movie. Okay. I'm um, sorry, what was that? It's it's a movie reference. Cool. Uh, I hope that makes you appreciate this more, but I guess I don't watch enough movies. Um, all right, so that's enough about HGB status codes for now. Um, so like I mentioned, there's a bunch of response headers you might get. Some of these look similar to the request headers. Uh, there's a particularly important one, set cookie, which is used for setting cookies in the browser. This is one way that we're going to um, save data on the client from the server. This is how the server can recognize a client on repeated visits. This is an important topic that we're going to talk about in later weeks. And so I just want to reiterate again that loading a single web page is often more than one HTTP request. So there's one request for the HTML file itself, but every link tag, every script tag, every IMG tag um, is sending an HTTP request to get that external resource. You know, anything with an href or an SRC attribute on it, it needs to send an HTTP request when the HTML document loads in order to you know, satisfy that element. Now, um, an important characteristic of HTTP is that it is a stateless protocol, which means that from one request to the next, the server does not remember who the client is. The client is responsible for providing all the information that the server needs in order to satisfy the request. So you can't send a so if you send a server request like, um, give me the 10 most recent recipes added to this website, the server can be like, okay, great. Here are the 10 most recent recipes added to this website. And then if you send another request asking, okay, now give me the next 10, the server is gonna respond with the next 10 what? So that request would have to be phrased as, you know, give me the second page of results for, you know, the latest recipes added to this website with 10 per page. So that specifies everything the server would need to satisfy that request. Now, of course, there are some kind of violations to this principle. In some ways, it will seem like we're adding state. There are some kind of exceptions. Um, for authentication, you know, we certainly have to make exceptions because authentication is important. And cookies are kind of the loophole in the, our stateless protocol. But we're going to get to that later and learn in much more depth how cookies work. Uh, but so long story short, it's controlled by HTTP headers. The server uh, uses an HTTP header set cookie to tell the client to store the cookie. So then the server can forget about it. But when the client revisits a website that it has cookies for, it automatically sends those cookies up to the server. Um, and so that's an automatic behavior that our browser does. And it's uh, very convenient in a lot of cases. Also creates some security issues. Uh, there are ways hackers can take advantage of that automatic behavior. But in a lot of cases, um, it makes it simpler to develop authenticated websites because all of the authentication on the client side happens automatically. We only have to write code on our server for handling authentication in large part. So in summary, you know, HTTP is the standard protocol of the web. It's battle tested. We've been using it for decades. Relatively simple, human readable, but also parsable by machines. And yeah, it's the foundation of the internet. Do we have any questions about HTTP?
No questions. Okay, so let me explain just a couple more acronyms real quick. An API is an application programming interface. So the critical bit here is interface. It describes how things interact with each other. So for example, every library or framework that you'll use has an API that describes what methods you can call from the library framework and what you can expect them to do. You know, what um, arguments you have to pass into them and what values they'll return to you. But most commonly when people talk about APIs, they're talking about uh, web APIs, HTTP APIs, JSON APIs, RESTful APIs. These are all similar terms they're going to talk about sending a request so, to someone else's server and getting data back from it. And so the API in that case describes what types of HTTP requests you can send and what types of response you'll get back. What exactly does that mean? Which part? So like, are you, is it like basically, hey, instead of hosting this image on my site, like I'm going to post your URL in my HTML is like, like, what are you requesting? I mean, it's kind of like that. Um, but it's more going to be for like data, you know, objects, strings and numbers and whatnot. So you're going to send a request to some other server and they're going to give you their data in JavaScript. And then you can, you know, loop through their data and display it on the screen or whatever you want to do. We'll see shortly how we can uh, work with an API. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Um. So fortunately, there are many um, free public APIs that are available for us to use. There's this handy dandy list in GitHub that is maintained that I encourage you all to look through for inspiration. It's um, you know, grouped by topics. So let's look for an animal API. So you, know, you can get dog facts, cat facts, all kinds of weird data about all kinds of weird animals. Um, there's a whole lot of anime APIs and get you information about, you know, different animes, when they were published, all the different characters in them, stuff like that. Um, on the right, there's some information about the APIs. So HTTPS is telling us if it uses HTTP or HTTPS, you know, is this API secure? Um, hopefully these should basically all be on HTTPS. Auth is if this requires any authentication. So do you have to be logged in to use this API? Many APIs do require you to sign up and get a key and then be logged in. So that's to prevent abuse. So you don't just like, you know, spam the API a thousand times a second and then make it inaccessible for everyone else. But many APIs have no authentication. They're just not popular enough that that's been a problem. Um, and so today I'm going to show you an API that has no authentication, so it's going to be easier for us to use. Um, although I believe your homework for tonight or in the near future 
is going to involve um, authenticated APIs. So you're going to actually have to figure out, um, you know, how to get these keys and whatnot. Um, and lastly, this column here about cores, uh, that's short for cross-origin resource sharing. I'm not going to get into details about what that is quite yet. We'll talk about that later on in the course. But long story short, um, some APIs can be used from the front end. Like I'm gonna show you today how to use an API from JavaScript. Some APIs cannot be used from the front end in JavaScript. You can only access them from the back end, like with Python, for example. And that's what this column is telling you. So it needs to support cross-origin resource sharing in order for you to consume it from the front end. So for now, you're gonna be limiting yourself to APIs that say yes in this column. But when we come back to APIs with Python and Django, then you'll be able to use any of these APIs regardless of whether they support cores or not. Justin, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. So kind of bringing this out into the kind of conceptual realm again. Um, hmm. So an API lives on the receiving end, right? So you build it into where you want the data to, to end up, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to the source of the information that you're pulling through this API, uh -huh. how do you determine where a source would exist? Is this, is this scraping information off of the, the surface of a, another website or are you digging into somebody else's back end you have no or idea it's none of your domain. business i'm sorry you have no idea and it's none of your business they just have a contract saying this is what you can ask us and this is what we'll tell you in response oh. and maybe it's in a database um maybe there's just a guy who's got the information written down on note cards and he like reads it and types it out to you in response uh, maybe they're just getting it from yet someone else's api and they're just a middleman um it's not really clear to us as consumers of the API where the data is actually coming from. So uh, how, how do you, so are you just putting, putting like an open request for data out there and then hoping it connects? Or is there, does the, does the person with the data have to set up like a, 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 a an origin API to even uh, uh, kind of advertise the fact that they have information they're willing to share? I mean, how do you know where to find the information that you're, you're, how do you know it exists or if somebody's willing to give it up or, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you gave us that link to the, the GitHub that had a repository, which is great, I guess, but if you didn't have that, how would you even know where to look for information or? or... Um, I mean, generally wishful thinking. Huh. So let's say like, I want to get data from LinkedIn. Or just uh -huh. search LinkedIn okay, good API. example, yeah. Um, okay, and then they'll take you to, you know, developer.linkedin.com. So a lot of uh, websites don't like advertise on the front page that, that, they, that they have an API because that's just too nerdy. Most people don't know what that means. Sure. But if you go to developer.website.com, you know, okay. you can find API information often. Okay, so you have to find somebody who, who has information that they're willing to provide via a, an, an open API. It's kind of like them creating the mail socket. That means you have to create the female socket and connect the two and you've you know created a, a power cable so to speak right <laughs> yeah transmission okay i yeah. guess that makes sense so someone is deliberately providing the data to you in an api Are you having a a documentation. Conversation? <laughs> Pardon? sorry yeah i'm just trying to understand i guess yeah because but uh do you, do you need an API to scrape information off the surface of somebody's website? You know what I mean? Information that is fed to you? No. So yeah. you're talking about scraping, which is just like you request an HTML web page and then read it like a string and try to grab information out that you want. Okay. That is specifically for situations where the website doesn't have an API and you mm. want their data anyway. <laughs> okay. So for example, um, like Craigslist, um, has a lot of data submitted by users and it's all like 
human readable. You can just click through their website and just read the posts and stuff. It's public. It's just not. Right. But they want to limit people's access to their data because like it, it could be possible just to scrape everything on Craigslist and then publish it to another website that has like a better user interface or whatever. Um, but that would like cut into Craigslist ad revenue or however they make their money. I don't know. Um, so Craigslist, you know, for business reasons, does not want you scraping their website. So they definitely don't provide an API because the data is how they make all their money. Um, and they actually like have technology in place to try to detect scraping. Like they'll look at your user agent and try to determine that you're a real web browser. Mm. Um, they'll try to prevent people from sending too many requests too fast stuff like that. So I actually knew a guy who um, got started in his career as a developer, as a professional web scraper, like he wasn't making applications. He just like took money from people who wanted to get Craigslist data. And so he built these applications that would just like constantly send web requests to Craigslist, but like rotating through different proxies and like having random delays between the requests. So it seems more like a human. There's all these little tricks that you have to do in order to like, you know, get through their scraping detection. Um, but it's not illegal, by the way. I think there was like some Supreme Court case that upheld that like public data is public data and scraping is lawful. Uh, but it certainly does violate their terms of service. And so you can expect that they'll be unhappy with you. Got it, thanks. Uh, also fun fact is that guy was one of the original authors of Real Python which is like a Python resource that you'll probably see linked around and was also one of my peers in a boot camp and my former roommate for a brief period of time. So, I don't know, fun story. The developer community is smaller than you might think. Um, so now that we know what an API is, we have one last acronym before I start actually showing us code, I apologize for this alphabet soup that I've got in my notes here. But we need to learn about Ajax. So, so generally speaking, there are many ways that you can send an HTTP request. So you know, if you type into the URL bar of your browser and you press enter, that sends a GET request. If you click on a link, that sends a GET request. Submitting a form submits some type of HTTP request. Um, whenever a script CSS file or an image needs to load, that sends an HTTP request, you know? Um, but so generally speaking, when you send an HTTP request by like typing into the URL bar, clicking the link, submitting the form, um, generally speaking, the browser has to unload the current page. You know, it gets blanked out with a white screen and then replaces it entirely with the response from that next HTTP request. And like you also lose your JavaScript context. So the browser forgets all the variables you had in JavaScript, and then it loads up again fresh with whatever the next page is going. So this is kind of like the foundation of the web, and it definitely works well for the most part. Um, but to build a more elegant, more modern application, we need a way to send an HTTP request in the background without interrupting the user's experience. So this technique for sending an HTTP request in the background without actually um, unloading the page and without forgetting all of our JavaScript data is called AJAX. So this stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. So the important part of this is asynchronous JavaScript. Synchronous means one thing after another. Asynchronous means multiple things happening at the same time. 
So asynchronous JavaScript, just meaning that we're able to run JavaScript code while also sending this request at the same time. And then when we get a response back, then we can do something with that, with that response, but the rest of our application doesn't have to wait for it. And then XML is the data type. XML is a, a type of data. It looks similar to HTML. But honestly, um, nowadays, we don't usually include XML data in AJAX requests. We generally use JSON data instead. So like I said before, JSON is basically the lingua franca of the web. It's kind of a universal language that all APIs understand, no matter what language, like Python, JavaScript, PHP, it was actually underneath it. Everyone understands JSON. So you might think that since we're not actually using XML, that a more appropriate acronym would be AJAG for asynchronous JavaScript and JSON, but that sounds stupid. And AJAX sounds really cool. So that's what we continue calling it, even though nobody uses XML. Um, so believe it or not, this technique, AJAX, was first made possible in the late 90s um, by Microsoft in Internet Explorer. They added an object called XML HTTP request. So in typical Microsoft fashion, it has a really long and unintuitive name that has all kinds of mixed case. This honestly just like really offends me to read it, how like XML is all caps, but then HTTP is just a capital H, but whatever Microsoft named it, I'm not gonna think too hard about it. Um, this is also called an XHR request, which is a term that you might hear occasionally. So if you see XHR, you can just know that that's synonymous with Ajax. Um, I believe actually the DevTools uses that acronym. So if we look in the network tab of DevTools, um, and we can see the different types of requests. It's Okay, so, so this button over here says fetch slash XHR. I guess they're kind of changing the labeling for it um, because nowadays, uh, browsers have a built-in feature called fetch. This does the same thing as XHR, but just with a much simpler interface. So XHR still exists. Um, Yeah, so this thing, it's a function, native code built in the browser, but um, you know, designed by Microsoft over 20 years ago. So nowadays, fetch is a more modern alternative. So I guess that phrasing is even sneaking into the network tab. So now type, they're calling these fetch requests instead of XHR requests. And that terminology, I guess it's being phased out, but it still lives on in this toggle over here. They're calling it fetch slash XHR, but those are synonymous basically. It just means it's an Ajax request. It happened in the background.
All right, so now we're gonna actually see some code. Y'all can ask some questions while I'm just typing out my basic HTML. Now, in order to send some HTTP requests, I'm, I'm actually gonna use a third party library for this. I was just talking all about fetch, how it's built in the browser, but I'm gonna use another JavaScript tool for this that's a little bit more well-suited for our purposes. So I need a script tag. Um, let's see here, I'm gonna go see. And Axios is the name of the library that we're gonna be using. Get that from CDNJS. It's a CDN that has lots of common JavaScript fi files, as you might imagine from the name. I'm gonna get the script tag here for uh, Axios. So I've got that in. And then after Axios, I want to load my script. Now it's important that I do it in that order because my script is going to use Axios. So Axios must be loaded first. Uh, let me console log here, just make sure this is hooked up. And let's run a server. Cool. So here we are at localhost 8000, nothing on the page because I didn't add any HTML content. Let us open up our developers tools. Okay, cool. We see the hello. Great. Looks like that's working. So next thing I want to do is find a cool API to work with. Uh, and by find, I mean, I'm going to use the Pokemon API, which I've already found because I know it. I love it. And I think it's great. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are many, many Pokemon or tiny little monsters have a whole bunch of interesting characteristics about them. And this API can return data about various different Pokemon. Um, it's a really great beginner API, I think, because it doesn't require any authentication, has very good documentation. And it is um, about a concept that many of us might already be familiar with. Um, and so generally the way we use it is we send a request. In this case, they only take get requests because most public APIs don't let you change their data. They only let you view their data. So we're going to send a get request to pokeapi.co api v2 because you often have multiple versions of your API and you can't just like stop supporting the old one immediately. You have to phase them out gradually. So using the v2 version of the API and then specifically, we want to get Pokemon from this API, and I'm interested in Ditto. So if we submit this request, this is kind of an example of what you'd get back. It's this big old object with tons of nested data inside of it. So let me, let me try to access that API now. So because I've loaded Axios, it's in that other script that we loaded, I can just uh, refer to it. And then if I want to send a request, I'm gonna send a get request. So I'll call axios.get, type in the URL. So that sends a request, but this doesn't give me access to the data. So 
Something that is uh, a little bit tricky about JavaScript is that much of it is asynchronous, that there's lots of things going on at the same time. And so we have to you know, figure out how to manage these things happening simultaneously and deal with things when they're done, even though we don't know when that's going to be. So in some ways, writing our JavaScript code is going to be harder than Python code, because the Python code always executes top to bottom, one thing after another. We kind of know how long everything, or like the code waits for the other code to finish. Whereas in JavaScript, a lot of our code is not waiting for other code. And so it's going to be harder to reason about you know, the order things happen. Uh, Dalton, did you have a question? Yeah, could you just go back to your index file for a second? I just wanted to see. Uh, How much going on? And, and I'm sorry, where did you, oh, are you assigning access to the script or am I missing something? I'm not assigning anything. It's just loaded here. And that like loads Axios into JavaScript. Because remember in the front end, everything is in a shared environment. There's only one window object. There's one global object that all these scripts have to share. So if this script defines a global variable, it's going to be accessible in all of my other scripts. So okay. this script defines the global variable Axios, which I can refer to it here. I know it looks a little bit weird because I'm referring to this thing that wasn't explicitly imported. Like, you can't understand where Axios comes from from looking in this file. You have to look in another file, which some people might not like, but that's how the web works. And is it just defined Axios because that's the file name? Um, no. Somewhere in this script, it actually has like const Axios equals function and then okay. defines what it does. And you would just have to look at that script to figure that out, I'm assuming? Um, you would look at the documentation. Uh, cool, thank you. So yeah, it's uh, fairly well documented. Um, so anyways, when we send this request, this is an asynchronous request. Um, we don't get the data back from the API immediately. It takes maybe a few hundred milliseconds, which might sound fast, but in terms of waiting around for code, um, that's actually a very long time. And so we would like for other things to be able to happen in the background potentially while the request is going out. So um, axios.get doesn't return our data immediately, actually. What it returns is something called a promise. So the return value of axios.get is a promise object, has two important methods on it that we should be aware of. So the first one, most important, is dot then. So I'm just going to chain dot then off of here. And the argument to dot then is a function that describes what do we want to do when this finishes. Can you wrap your text, please? So first, we're sending this request to axios.get. This is going to take some unspecified amount of time to finish. And then when it's done, we do this, whatever is in this function. And when Axios calls this function for us, it's going to pass in the data from the API. So let's just see what that looks like.
Cool. So we see our hello. And then down here, we get data. So it's a big old object. This is going to be one of the challenges in working with APIs, is you will often get a lot of data returned to you, much more data than you know or care about. And so your challenge is going to be digging through that API response for the information that is actually meaningful to you. So at this top level, it's not even the API data. It's kind of information about the request, like the status code, um, the response headers. Uh, but then in the data property, this actually has the information that we wanted. Um, so here is the ID. Like every Pokemon has an ID number. Ditto is the 132nd Pokemon. Uh, let's see, every Pokemon has one or two types. Uh, Ditto is a normal type Pokemon. Um, they've got moves. Every Pokemon appears in one or more different Pokemon video games. And so this is just showing you all the different versions of Pokemon in which you can catch a Ditto. Let's see, uh, also importantly, sprites. This shows you pictures of that Pokemon. So we want to see the front default picture for Ditto. It's this PNG URL. Look at that cute little guy. Uh, yeah, and so if we want to, you know, dig a little deeper or if we want to access this information in our code, we just have to you know, drill into these objects and arrays of objects. So let's say I just want to know what type Ditto is. So I saw on the response, um, there was a data property. And in data, there was a types property, which is an array. So types is an array with one element, but the zero element. And each of those types um, seems a little redundant to me, but it is a dictionary, it's an object, which has one key called type, which has two keys, and I want the name. So dot type dot name. So if I didn't mess anything up, this should tell me that Ditto is a normal type Pokemon. Alicia, do you have a question? Yeah, so sorry I keep asking you to go back for me, but I've never heard of all of this stuff. So why are we using Axios to request this instead of just, I don't even know how, but submitting the request ourselves? Right. So like I said before, uh, fetch is built into the browser. And so we could, if we wanted to, just use fetch to send these HTTP requests and you know, get our Pokemon data back. I could build this exact same demo just using fetch, which is built into the browser. Um, there are just a few minor reasons why Axios is preferable. So for one thing, um, the API for Fetch is a little bit awkward, I think. Um, th this demo would just be a little bit more complicated if I did it using Fetch than using Axios. There would be just like a little bit more code. It would be a little bit harder for me to explain. Um, but also professionally, Axios has extra features that are very useful in like professional situations. Um, Fetch is kind of basic. It's bare bones. It just sends a request, gives you a response. If you wanted to have more advanced features, you have to build them yourself on top of it. But Axios has a lot of advanced features that are useful professionally. So like setting default values for headers, like if you're setting the same headers on every request, Axios lets you set defaults for those. So you don't have to specify them every time. And there are other little niceties that it provides you. Um, also, Axios is just overwhelmingly popular. So in all of my recent jobs, Axios has been the library that we use for sending HTTP requests. There are others, but Axios is definitely the most popular one. And I think it is very likely that in your first job, 
if you are writing front-end JavaScript or back-end JavaScript, it is very likely that you will be using this exact library. Okay, so it's still sending an HTTP request or similar to the built-in fetch method. It's just more convenient, essentially. Yeah, slightly right. more convenient, in my opinion. Okay. Some people disagree with me. Some people would prefer to use fetch. But I think if you saw both code snippets side by side, you'd think Axios was nicer. Um, okay. Uh, Justin, oh, this is all JavaScript that you've been showing us. Would right. we ever do anything like this with Python? Yeah. So this is what I mentioned previously about cores, which I don't want to get too deep into that quite yet. But in order for us to uh, get this data from the Pokemon API, I'm only able to do that because the API supports cores. They support cross-origin resource sharing. Um, which makes the data available to me in the front end. For other APIs that don't support cross-origin resource sharing, then you would have to make the API request from Python, from your back end. So you, there will definitely be some APIs where you'll have to send the request from Python instead. And in a later week, actually next week, I think, there will be a homework assignment where you're gonna have to authenticate for an API and then send API requests using Python. Sound good? It was cross origin, what, what? Cross origin resource sharing. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, definitely something that is uh, very poorly understood, commonly misunderstood by, I will say, most developers. So if you can actually talk intelligently about it, that like, puts you a step up above a lot of people. Uh, Justin, did you have a question? Uh, I just wanted to clarify my understanding. Uh, is Axios a kind of a, a, a framework for receiving information through an API? Um, just that, I mean, do, we, do you build an API on your end using Axios or is it simply just a something to help us organize receiving information? Um, Axios is a library. I wouldn't say it's a framework. It's a library for oh, sending okay. HTTP requests. And I guess the flip side of that is you get a response. So yeah, it's for sending and receiving information. From a known API. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, it could be your own API. Like you could use, and we will use sure. Axios for communicating with our own Python backends. Okay, but it's for handling APIs, not for making. APIs. Right. This okay. does the actual legwork of sending and receiving data. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. When we get to Python and Django, we'll learn how to build an API. Um, all right. So a couple things to know. So I said axios.get returns a promise which has the dot then method on it. Dot then also returns a promise. So if I want, I can chain another dot then off of this if I want to do something else after this finishes. I'm not gonna do that in this case. What I'm gonna do is show you the other promise method, which is dot catch. So dot catch is the other important method that promises have. And this is how you specify what happens if the request fails. So if there's an error of any sort, um, it's not gonna actually throw an error because it's happening in the background. So we need to use a different technique for handling that error. So I'm gonna write a function here. And when this function is called, it's going to get the error passed in. For now, we're just going to log it. And 
I'm going to break this URL, take out the H of the HTTPS. So that's going to throw an error. Now, when I refresh the page, it doesn't actually give me any red text because I handled the error. I caught the error, but we do see our error handler run. So instead of seeing ditto's type, we see no good, uh, error, bad request. Um, what was the status code though? I wonder if it didn't even make the request because they recognize that H that like TTPS is not a valid URL. So yeah, maybe it didn't even make the request. But anyway, Axios threw an error and I caught it using dot catch. So this is great. Promises are awesome. They help us uh, manage asynchronous code, do things in the background while our other code is running in the foreground. Because figure like in a lot of web applications, you need JavaScript in order to just make the page interactive and responsive, you know, for opening uh, collapsible sections or accordions and carousels and whatnot. So you definitely don't want JavaScript to be frozen while it's busy sending an HTTP request. So because JavaScript is very much like a user focused programming language, it's really important that we're able to do things in the background. However, uh, some people don't really like this style of coding using promises because in order to specify what happens afterwards, we have to indent. Um, so oftentimes if we're like chaining promise operations or like doing asynchronous things inside of asynchronous things, um, we get indented very deeply which is called the pyramid of doom in JavaScript. Um, also, another problem with promises when they're written like this is that you cannot use uh, try catch anymore. So we have to use dot catch instead of our usual try catch um, in JavaScript. And so that's also kind of undesirable. So there is an alternative in JavaScript called async await. So what this is, is it's a different syntax for managing promises that lets us write our promise-based code in a style that looks similar to synchronous code. So I'm going to show that real quick. So first things first is I'm labeling this function as async. So I use this little async keyword before the function itself. And so this is how JavaScript knows I'm making an async function. So now, because I'm inside of an async function, I can use the await keyword. That's really all async does, is it says that you can use await inside of this function. 
Now the await keyword, what this does is anytime you get a promise where you would try to call dot then off of it or dot catch, instead you can await that promise so that your program will wait until the promise resolves and then return that value. Um, which by the way, just some quick bit of terminology. Here I'm creating a promise to send a request. When the promise does what it's trying to do and it runs this function, that's called resolving. If an error is thrown, the promise doesn't do what it's trying to do. This, fun this function runs, which is called the promise rejecting. So maybe I'm missing something here, but I, I'm not, and maybe you're about to show it, but like, I'm not sure what writing the async is really, how is that gonna prevent you from having indented code? Um, because it seems like you're just saying, hey, before you move on to the next thing, wait to get this value. How does that prevent you from having a bunch of thens and catches? Well, so normally when I write axios.get, it doesn't return the data, it gives me just a promise. So then I have to call dot then in order to you know, actually access the data because the data gets passed into this function. When I'm using async await, I can actually assign to a variable and then this is the actual data from the API. So then without indenting, I can just look at the response. Um, Can you scroll up so we can see both? Do you mind? So here, instead of having the chain dot then off of my dot get call, because I awaited it, I just get the response, not immediately, it still takes the same amount of time, but I get the response assigned to this variable and I don't have to chain dot then or use a callback function, the indented code, I just on the next line underneath it, I've got access to that data. Let's comment this out now. Oh, right, the same bad URL over here. Cool, so that's telling me again that he is a normal type. Now let's make this a little more interesting though. And we'll get the URL for the type. So that's a URL. This is gonna show me other Pokemon that have this same type. So this is where like APIs get really powerful. Um, I sent one request and in the response, it gave me a URL that I can use to continue exploring the API. So now I've sent one request, gotten a response, read the response to pick a URL out from it, and then sent another request to that URL and then read that response. So now uh, this should be showing me 
uh, just a whole bunch of other Pokemon that have the normal type. Yeah, here we go. There are, I guess, 131 normal type Pokemon. Seems like kind of a small number, given that there's like thousands of Pokemon. You would think that normal is not the most uncommon type because it's really kind of abnormal at that rate, but whatever. I'm not here to get into a uh, philosophical conversation about Pokemon types. Um, yeah, and so now I can actually use try catch with this. So try. All right, wait, so real quick. So yep. I'm not understanding the difference between type URL and type. So it seems like type response is just an object form of that URL. Is that is that right? So the URL is just the URL. Um, let's print that out. Oh, so it's 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 just just the URL, and then well, okay, because it seems like when you went to that, it showed all the same data, but just on the page. I mean, when I click the URL. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is if I send a request, this is Got what it. it would give me back. It's just now it's rendered by my browser and it's kind of ugly. What would be much more useful is to request that URL from Axios so I can access that data in JavaScript. So yeah, like I was saying, this is just the URL, the type URL, uh, what we've got here. But then we can send another request to Axios, get request at the type URL, and then that's going to give us another HTTP response. So we can, uh, and again, without indenting, without calling dot then, it just gets assigned to this variable because we have awaited the promise. So can you show me how you would do all of that with the dot, the dot thens? Unless we're just like never going to do it that way. If this is if it's just standard practice to always do it like this, then I don't really need to see it. It's important to understand both styles. Yeah, that's a good question. There hasn't, but it seems like I'm curious what you think, Raphael. Like async and await have gotten way more common than they were, but there's not yet. Absolutely, a strong consensus yet. Um, so I'd say in general, async await is great if you're just trying to do one thing after another. Like if your intention is that every line of code should wait for the line before it, then async await is a very convenient way to write your code. Um, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes there are like 10 things going on at once and you don't want to take any action until they're all done or you want to act whenever the first one is finished or whatever. If you have more complicated situations, where you have multiple things going on at the same time, then you might have to manually manage promises. And then you're going to get into more code kind of like this. But for more common everyday situations, I would say async await is easier to write and easier to read. Raphael, do you think it's worth showing people curl? If not now, at some future point, just as another, just as another way to visualize and see the HTTP request response cycle? Um, you said curl? Yeah, the uh, command line tool. Yeah, yeah. I thought you said curl at first. No, that was no I, yeah, it's the, the laptop mic. Sorry. Um, it could be useful, maybe like a kind of breakout session this afternoon. I used to like showing people Netcat for kind of similar purposes. Maybe do something like that. Um, but yeah, we're definitely running out of time this morning to yeah. get into that. Um, but yeah, so to Alicia's question, I do type URL equals this. And then
Does that work? You forgot the H part. Oh, yeah. Issue. Cool. So uh, I've recreated that second demo now with the promise style, uh, data, data, and Pokemon. So yeah, 131 normal type Pokemon. But as you can see here, you know, after sending the first promise, this first HTTP request, we indent, and then inside of there, I want to send another one, and so we indent again. Um, and honestly, I being a little bit stupid about this. So this does demonstrate like the pyramid of doom, how every time I want to do another async request, it's indented again and again. And in the past, this was kind of unavoidable. Technically, there is a better way I could be using promises here. So where is response to defined? Um, it's so response to is the parameter to this function. It's basically defined right here. I'm saying that I want to send a GET request to this URL, and then some unspecified time later, Axios is going to return that data to me. I have written this function that describes what I want to do with that data. Axios is going to pass that data into my function. And I have declared up here that when Axios passes that data into my function, I'm going to call it response to inside of this function. Okay, so response to is just like when we choose any random word as a parameter for our function. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if folks haven't seen it, that's a um, arrow function that's defined in there. I, I know we've seen some of that. The syntax also, it, it starts to add up in terms of its difference when with with JavaScript written this way, and we'll be seeing more and more of it, um, and, and, and you'll get used to it. Um, OK, yeah, I think this is how you're actually supposed to use promises. Um, so data, so we still got the same 131 normal Pokemon. So this is an example of more conventional promise chaining. You know, axios.get is going to, um, you know, send a request. We're going to get access to that response in here. And then, you know, what do I want to do with that response? We're going to use it to basically just send another request. But then I return the promise from this dot then function, and that makes it accessible in the next dot then function. So in this way, we can like chain our dot then functions, do some asynchronous work here, and then pass it through the next one, do some maybe more asynchronous work there, pass it through. But if there's an error in any of these, it gets caught here. So this lets us get around the pyramid of doom, but it still um, prevents us from using try catch, which I guess I didn't show that down here, but I really like try catch in JavaScript. I just feel like it's very simple and effective. Um, so I think it's kind of a shame that we have to use dot catch instead of try catch. Uh, and this is also just more code to write 
more like punctuation marks, brackets and whatnot. So this is like totally ordinary uh, conventional promise-based code. But I think nowadays async await is getting popular and people would prefer to write their code like this. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, whatever is returned from dot then is always a promise. So here, you know, I know axios.get returns a promise, but even if I return something else, like just the number four, this function would still receive a promise. So, but it would just get the number four wrapped up in a promise. So don't worry too hard about that right now, but long story short is dot then always returns a promise. Just so it has like a consistent interface, no matter what you return. So I just wanted to real quick complete this example. Some try. So this should work the same way again. Um, yeah, so now it's just showing me all those normal type Pokemons. Uh, but if there was an error in the URL, then instead it skips the rest of the try block and it goes to the catch block and just prints out the error message. So well, in my opinion, mean, this code sorry. is much easier to read. Just more reading it from top to bottom. There's much less punctuation. It's more, more like normal JavaScript code that you would have written before you even learned about promises. So it's just familiar. I like it. Uh, what questions do we have? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, why do we need a, why do we need to say response.data? Like what is there in a response aside from data? Like on line 31. So this is the response. Uh, one of the properties is the data, but it also has other information about the response. So it's status code, um, headers. It also includes the request on it, just for your reference, I guess. Uh, that shouldn't be too interesting because I sent the request. I should know what was in it. Uh, maybe if you send a bunch of requests, it can be useful. I don't know. Um, config information about the request, you know, if you had like defaults set or whatever. So yeah, it's just more information about the request, but the actual data you're trying to get from the API is gonna be in response.data. So do we typically like always refer to the data when we're querying an API? Yeah. Or is there common. like ever, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Do we have other questions? We had 99 uh, plus in the chat, I've never seen it so busy. So when it comes to, I, I guess I kind of get confused if I don't understand. So like, would we be, like, would we use the API to get data as a developer? Or would you like set a function so that like the user could search the API to return? Or I guess, is it interchangeable? Could you do both? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question? Like, so I'm trying to understand like, when would you use an API, I guess? So would, is it something you as a developer kind of, grab to get information to do more development or is it usually something you'll create so that the user can put some sort of input and they can see data from whatever API? Does I that mean, make sense? It's hard to give a very specific response. Just anytime you want to use someone else's data in your application, you know, you can use an API. Like if I want to build an application that's all about Pokemon and it requires me to know all of their details, well, like I don't have a database of Pokemon and it would take me a really long time to build that. So fortunately I can just use someone else's database instead. Um, I think common examples of APIs are like people will use APIs for weather, just
just, you know, what's the weather going to be in this date in the near future or whatever. And then combine that with like an API for travel or whatever. So you can see like, oh, when's a good day to travel based on the weather? Just any like question that you can answer by combining information from multiple different sources. Maybe you could build an API backed application that solves those kinds of problems. So that yeah, that. It's also just, used a lot on online games. Like if you have like a bunch of weapons that you can get and then someone, not the game developer, but someone can make their own website with using the API to pull out like all the weapon types. So people can search through the weapons and see like what they, what kind they want or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. A uh, lot of people, I think it started with like practice projects, building APIs for games and stuff, because probably no one is already getting paid to do that, but there is a community of people who are interested in your work. So it can be kind of cool. Yeah. And just to kind of add on to that. So like, imagine you need to ship a package. You can go to the UPS website. You can fill out a form. The form talks to the server and all that stuff. And, and then all that's in their database and then they ship your package. Now imagine you're a company that ships people flowers where you can go and order flowers online. And I'm, I'm drawing from a, a friend I worked with who worked at that company. And you need to ship thousands of, of, of bouquets of flowers around the country or more every day. Um, it'd be really hard to do that, go on and fill in in forms. Ideally, you have in your database or you have a giant spreadsheet, all the information about what the package is and where it needs to go. Um, UPS then has an API where you can interact with the, the tools it gives you via the API, via these HTTP requests like we've been seeing today so that you can write a program to ship thousands of flowers a day. If that, if that made, hopefully that made a little sense. Yeah, I, I def, that pretty much answers it. I, I, I do have one more really quick one. And Adam, I think already kind of explained it, but if you go back up to your, like the initial one, the, uh, yeah. So is that like the only time you can use your return statement in a function and it won't end the function? Because usually whenever you put return, like anything below that is inaccessible. I mean, it does end the function. We haven't changed the basic rules of JavaScript. When I return here, this function ends. Oh, and you create a new one. Yeah, oh. then it returns an object which has methods which I call, which take callback functions. And then this is yet another function. Okay. So cool. many functions. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? John, what's up? Uh, so we use the Axios, uh, we, we put that into our HTML so we have access to it. And so is that, is the get and then, are those like keywords that not inherit in JavaScript, but that's what Axios provides us? Great question. So get, this is part of the Axios API. Axios has a bunch of methods for different types of requests like get, post, put, delete. Um, but after that, Axios just returns a promise. And a promise is just a generic JavaScript content, um, JavaScript concept. So all promises have the methods dot then and dot catch. So what you're seeing from here on, this is not specific to Axios. This is just generic promise handling in JavaScript. Uh, so in general, I'd say it? that, all right, go on. We're using Axios's API in this case to access Pokemon API. Yes, basically. although there are different types of APIs. Right, right. And then uh, in the in the second example, you use the await uh, ace. Was it async await? Async await. Is that also uh, using the Axios API? No, async await has nothing to do with Axios in particular. It's kind of like a layer on top of promises. I would think of them as just being related to promises and it's another like fundamental JavaScript concept independent from any like specific tool or library. Okay, thank you. Yep. And then I think we've got time for one more question. Definitely saw another hand up.
I'm still kind of confused about something if nobody else wants to go. Let's hear it. Okay, so uh, can you scroll back up to the to the other one? Uh, so line, what is line twelve return? Is it like a an object? Some kind of like object that type URL returns? Like, is it something coming from the API? Right. So the API gave me a response with data. And then deep in that response is a URL. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's like a bunch of JSON that it's returning, right? Right. How does, how can you call dot then on a JSON? Like, wouldn't that give you just like, um, right. Wouldn't so, it just tell you like, I, you know, there's no dot then right well that's on this json not quite what we're doing so look okay. carefully i know it's easy to get confused here um but so this function here this is returning a string type url um but we're not actually assigning the return value of this function to anything like i don't actually see what happens to that return value that's not written in my code but i just know because i know how promises work that uh, whatever I return from the then callback function, um, the actual dot then function will return something based on that. It doesn't actually return the thing that I returned from its callback. It returns a promise that contains the thing that was returned from the callback. So what is actually returned from this whole dot then function is not type URL, but it's a promise that resolves to well, actually what we're returning is the axios.get promise. So I should say that what we're returning is not the type URL or even the data from this response, but I'm returning a promise that will resolve to that data. So we can call dot then, because it returns a promise. Okay, yeah. And then it's gonna resolve to the data. So it's not returning an object, or it's not returning like a string from the API is returning like a promise object, right? Right. I know it's a little unintuitive. It seems kind of weird just looking at it here. I would strongly recommend all this, like play around with this a lot in our code. Just write dumb looking functions, log the outputs, see what you can see, try to understand it better. Um, this is probably like the most complex fundamental JavaScript concept that I want all of us to know. Like JavaScript doesn't really get more complex than this, but it is important that you understand this stuff deeply. Um, and on that note, we've gone a little bit over our lecture for today. There's no more time for questions, even though you have great questions, I'm sorry. Please post them in you know, Slack and we'll try to talk about it later because really APIs are very important stuff. So yeah, thank you for coming to my talk everybody.